And welcome to the National Building Museum. My name is Scott Kratz. I'm the Vice President of Education here at the museum. And tonight's program is the fourth in a brand new series called For the Greener Good, Conversations That Can Change the World. The goal of this series is to bring together the nation's leading experts to discuss sustainability and the built environment. The programs will track how we've arrived at our present situation, the anticipated and unexpected effects of the green movement, and offer considerations on a path to a more sustainable future. It is important that these programs provide not only solutions, but also how you, the audience, can participate in creating a better future. Tonight's program is entitled Living in a Disposable World, perhaps an appropriate topic given the flurry of gift buying in this holiday season. The typical American will spend $800 on holiday gifts this month. What are we doing to think about reducing our carbon footprint? Um, marketers are certainly catching the green wave. Over the weekend, I saw a full page ad in the New York Times advertising Barney's green gift card uh, that sport retro graphics and texts like save the planet and green is groovy. Uh, the green is groovy card will set you back $1,000. Earlier this month, um, I heard about a new green credit card that is about to launch in the United States. I'm not making this up. Um, already available in Europe that through a complicated algorithm promises carbon offsets for every type of purchase. Um, we can shop and help the environment, evidently. Um, or so they would have us think. Uh, or perhaps this is an opportunity for all, us, for all of us to take a closer look at what we're buying for holiday gifts for friends and family, the packaging it comes in, and where the waste goes, thinking about where products are produced and how much carbon they consume. Or we can think about the built environment. How much time do we think about the built environment that we live in? We spend 23, if not 24 hours a day in the built environment, um, and most of us probably don't know that over 40% of the greenhouse gases come from the creation and maintenance of buildings. How do we design buildings to be the most efficient that they can be, as each new structure that we build today will be with us for the next 50 or even 100 years? Or how do we preserve the embodied energy of existing buildings for adaptive reuse? Just last week, last Thursday night, Dick Moe, the president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, was, then, was in this great hall discussing the trust's efforts to quantify how the greenest building is the one that's already built. Tonight's program will explore these issues, um, the, such as creating more sustainable products, clothing, buildings, um, and look at what is the responsibility of the consumer versus the manufacturer. The, we had a wonderful um, talk over dinner upstairs, and I know we're in for a real treat. Um, the, these discussions have been designed to incorporate your questions and thoughts uh, in the program. They are meant to be conversational in format. We will break periodically during the program to take questions from the audience. And in an effort to get in as many questions and comments as possible, I'd ask you to, I'd ask you to be as brief as possible with your questions. And at the end of the program, we invite you to um, converse with both those who are up here on, on the stage as well as uh, the audience member next to you um, in a refreshments that will be in the center court. If you like what you hear and experience tonight, um, we invite you to our next four series in the program that begin in January 2008. Our first four programs focused on domestic issues in 2007, and the next four will look at sustainability around the world. I'm particularly excited about our January program, which is entitled, What Do One Billion People Living in Slums Mean to the Environment? Um, the participants include architect Sergio Palleroni, uh, Pietro Garo, uh, the past director of the United Nations Center for Human Settlements, um, Rose Malakane, the National Chairperson of the South African Homeless People's Federation, Michael Cohen, Director of the New School International Affairs Program, um, and finally, Maria Sonia Vincenta Fedrigo, who comes from Manila and is the Regional Coordinator of the Homeless People's Federation of the Philippines. The For the Green and Good series is presented by the Museum Sustainability Partner, the Home Depot Foundation, and we'd like to thank them for their generous support of this innovative lecture series. Before we begin tonight, um, can I get a quick idea of who is in the audience? It helps the panelists um, get an idea of who they were speaking to. Can I ask you if you can raise your hands if you're architects? Great. Uh, planners? Wonderful. Uh, landscape architects? Great. Um, engineers? The journalists? No journalist really is willing to admit they are. Um, students? Great. Um, federal estate employees? That's wonderful. Who did I miss? You can feel free just to call it out. Associations? Representative? Business? 
everyday citizen. That's great. Um, as always, we bring together a wonderful collection of not only um, presenters up here on stage, but the audience. Now, please join me in welcoming our moderator for this evening, who will in turn uh, introduce our distinguished panel. Susan Snazzy is Editor-in-Chief of Metropolis, the award-winning New York City-based magazine of architecture, culture, and design. Since 1986, she's led the magazine through years of landmark design journalism, achieving domestic and international recognition. Uh, she is an international recognized as an authority on sustainability and design. And in order to keep uh, the um, focus on the discussion, I could go on and on reading her um, list of achievements. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Susan to begin to lead the program. Susan. Thank you very much. And it's uh, really, I'm very happy to be here back at the Building Museum. Um, it was, I found out a couple of years ago that this building, like other buildings of its age, were actually made to breathe and uh, do its own uh, cooling. So, uh, you know, every time I hear the, the air conditioners kick on with the big machine sound, I get a little upset here because I know what this building can do. Anyway, that's another story for another time. Um, we have a wonderful group here that represents um, all kinds of concerns about the built environment and how, how our individual and group decisions are forming it and uh, how we need to all kind of uh, rethink of uh, what we're doing. So we have uh, with us uh, those people who produce uh, our buildings. Uh, we have an architect. Uh, we have uh, someone, a scientist, a chemist, who knows about packaging and who's, who's uh, uh, an expert in that area. We have an artist who uh, looks at the, the built environment and the results uh, of it that aren't the prettiest part. And uh, besides uh, that, he shows them in a really beautiful um, photographic mode. And then we have a, another artist who has turned into a landscape architect and an advocate for the environment. So I will start with the architect, with the, um, who, is, uh, uh, who is Tim Kraft, and uh, he is from Dallas, and he's a, an accredited lead professional, uh, and in the office of, uh, he heads up the sustainable practice for PSA Dewberry in Dallas. And uh, I assume that everybody in here knows what the USGBC's lead program is. Does, or if someone doesn't know, should we, Everybody knows LEAD, right? Yes. If you don't, raise your hand, we'll, we'll explain it. OK. So uh, I think uh, what's interesting about Tim is that he, like I, grew up, graduated in, in, uh, from college during the first oil crisis. And uh, there was a lot of talk about sustainability and building uh, uh, very site-sensitive architecture at that time, 1972. That went away very quickly, and we sealed our buildings, and we made the architects uh, into uh, people who uh, followed more the engineering construct than the actual creative architectural uh, mode that, that we hoped they, that they would be. Uh, what's also interesting is that uh, Scott mentioned that buildings are responsible for 40% plus of our greenhouse uh, um, emissions. That's an average. In New York, our percentage is 80%. We're over overbuilt. Any overbuilt environment like New York has 80, uh, our buildings produce 80% of our greenhouse emissions. Chicago just took an environmental audit and it's up to almost 70% of their greenhouse emissions come from buildings. So buildings are huge culprits uh, in the global warming picture. So um, I would like to ask Tim Kraft to talk about uh, why he feels that his voice and others like him uh, are really important in this dialogue about um, greening our environment. Tim? Well, as, uh, as an architect, I know there's a lot of architects in the, uh, office, in the uh, arena here. So let me just touch on uh, what you had mentioned, Susan, the fact that the uh, buildings are a huge contributor to the problem that we're facing here. Uh, architects, engineers, and contractors have the... Contractors. I wonder what that means. When you said contractors, it blew up. 
There's I, something prophetic about this. <laughs> but as, uh, you know, we, we really have an opportunity here in the next 20 years to um, change the course of the direction we're in. Um, we consume a tremendous amount of natural resources. Our current economic business model is not sustainable. As, uh, as you know, our governments can, uh, if we run out of money, we can produce more money to build more things. But that's not the case with our natural resources. They are exhaustible. So what we need to do is uh, take a, a solid approach to develop more sustainable buildings. Okay, so, so your biggest challenge you mentioned are who, you have two big challenges facing you right now. Who are they, just briefly, who are they and why? Um, you know, the, the cost of green, there's still this uh, false um, notion that it costs more to build green. So, you know, this has been put to our owners and we spend a, a great deal of effort trying to educate our owners that it does not cost more to do sustainable design. So there's always a resistance to change and, uh, and that's what we face with our owners and not only with our owners but within our own uh, corporation. Uh, we are educating our staff uh, to shift our culture to more of a, a sustainable business culture. Okay, so tell, uh, uh, one follow-up question. Mm -hmm. You have a reward program to, uh, to educating them. What is your reward program? Very, be very specific. People are looking for incentives. Give them your own incentives. Um, we offer a uh, $500 bonus to our employees who uh, take and pass the LEED AP exam. Uh, we also pay for the cost of the exam which is currently about $250. So it's a, it's a tremendous uh, incentive for uh, any design firm who wants to uh, boost their internal knowledge of sustainable design. Okay, so if ethics doesn't work, cash will. Absolutely. Okay, next we have the chemist, um, uh, who is uh, Sarah Wallace Hartwell. And uh, she is currently with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Office of Solid Waste. I love the, I love people who are into solid waste. <laughs> that is the sort of coming thing that we have to really think about. Solid waste is cool. Okay, and then you're also on the steering committee of Walmart's Packaging uh, Sustainable Value Network, which is very interesting to us. Uh, because of the large consumption that, that Walmart uh, represents to us. And uh, uh, you're also in the executive committee of, sustainable, uh, of the Sustainable Packaging Coalition. So uh, your, your contribution to this uh, conversation is clearly in the area of uh, product uh, packaging and, uh, and what we buy and uh, what, what what we end up sending to that wonderful solid waste system. Let's hear of your, your point of view on this. Um, thank you. It's, uh, my, my passion in all of this is in helping people understand and consider the impacts of purchase, use, and disposal decisions that, that we all make every day for um, just about everything, whether you know when you make coffee in the morning and whether you choose to drink bottled water or water out of the tap and whether you, how you choose to get to work, drive or walk or take public transport, reusable canvas bags at the grocery store or are you going to get that plastic bag and recycle it. There are many, many decisions that we make. They're all, probably all appear small in, in that individual decision, but collectively they're huge. Uh, landfills in the United States provide between 25 and 30 percent of the anthropogenic land Methane, landfill gas emissions in the United States. It's huge. 
but they also pres presents a real opportunity with landfills in terms of collecting that gas and using it for energy. And there's a lot of work going on there. But before it ever gets to the landfill, recycling presents such enormous um, energy and greenhouse gas emission avoidance potential. It's an easy decision to make. And if people consider that decision as they go to disposal, if they consider the potential for that decision when they make the purchase, will I be able to recycle it? Will I be able to reuse it? Will I be able to donate it? Where can this material go? What are its other life cycle implications? Um, as you buy appliances for your home or you put, buy counters for a new uh, construction, all of those are material decisions and they all have, every one of them comes with its own little carbon price tag. And if people can consider those price tags, not every decision has to be a perfect decision. We don't always have perfect information to make them. In some decisions, the right decision may be too hard to make for us at that point in time. That's OK, as long as we all make thoughtful decisions, make that decision, and then move on to the next one. That's what I'm into. So Sarah, what was the last thoughtful decision that you made that affected the environment? Today. Today? Um, I went to the grocery store at lunch, because I seem to go to the grocery store every day. We don't even need to go there. And um, I went in with my three big canvas grocery bags and came right out. Great. It's an easy one. Easy? Easy, but do and it's doable. OK, next we have an artist who actually started out life as a lawyer, an insurance litigator. A far cry from doing beautiful photographs. But his, uh, Chris Jordan's photos are extremely important to us today because they are very, very beautiful and very scary, incredibly scary. He will take all the consumer items that we just throw away really willingly, really easily, just toss that cell phone into the garbage, and he will group them and he will shoot thousands of them, and he will show us what we have done. So uh, Chris, I know you're very passionate about uh, the, the fact that that individual throwing away the cell phone or whatever garbage that we throw out really matters. Let's talk about that individual from your point of view. Well, my own view of it is I, I don't think that Americans are consumed by greed the way other countries think of us. I don't think we're bad people. My view of it is that, that the reason we're having such a hard time changing and going green is that we don't feel it enough. And part of the reason is that the, these cumulative effects of the individual choices of 300 million people are the, the way we learn about it, the way we find out about these, these giant environmental problems is through statistics and data that is very, very difficult for us to assimilate and experience and make meaning out of. And so, so when, we, when we see all of these, this information about our consumption, like that we use two million bottles in the United States every five minutes, well, it could be two billion, and it wouldn't really feel any different to us because both of those numbers are too big for us to, to comprehend. And so what I do is I take these statistical, the, these statistics, like the amount of plastic bottles we use or the amount of aluminum cans we use, uh, and make a photograph that actually shows that quantity of things so that you can see it and maybe experience it in a different way that allows for some feeling. And my underlying hope is I think what we need to do is to fall in love with the idea of going green. The way our nation fell in love with putting a person on the moon back in the 1960s. And if that's going to happen, it, ha it has to start with feeling. So that's kind of what I'm all about. Well, it's really interesting because we spent the, the most of the 20th century trying to get away from feeling, especially in architecture and in design. I remember in the 70s when uh, I tried to use the word beauty in architectural writing and the word home I was chastised by my editors that we don't use such words in writing about design. So uh, this sort of rational, you should pardon the expression, male idea of the world has been so pervasive that the feelings have been devalued in a huge way. And so your pictures 
bring out feelings. I mean, that you really feel like, oh my goodness, I, I have to connect, I have to do something, I have to think about this. Is, uh, uh, do you feel in your experience that that's, that's what the, the response is? You talk to uh, all kinds of groups and give lectures and give talks. What is, what, what is the most uh, dramatic reaction that you get to your work? Well, um, I tell you, it's, it's, I've been doing the, uh, this series that I call Running the Numbers. I don't know how many of you have, have seen my work, but it's these huge photographs of 426,000 cell phones, which is one, one day's worth of discarded cell phones, or uh, 15 million sheets of, of office paper, which is how much paper we use every five minutes, and so on. And the public response to this work has been astonishing to me far beyond, just in the last year, far beyond what, er, what I hoped would happen to me as an artist in my lifetime. And it's really inspiring because what, the way I interpret that is that I, I feel this craving on the part of American culture right now. And the metaphor that I carry about it is, I think American culture is kind of like a frat party. <laughs> and it's like 4.30 in the morning. And we've all been drinking bad alcohol for the whole night long, and we're all like lying around in pools of our own vomit. And there's this deep voice that that is that I just feel it ringing in our culture right now. This the, the kind of vo the, the voice that, that comes from way down that says, "I want to do something different. I, I want to connect with the earth and connect with my own self, and 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 do something more sensible." So my work is having this tremendous public response. Have you been back to your original tribe, the ABA, the lawyers, the American Bar Association? Have you been talking to that group? They need a little uh, uh, feeling there. Yeah, I, there are a lot of professions, I think, in, in yeah. our country right now that have, and, and a lot of people, because I know I was one of them for 10 years of my life. I, I was deeply in the consumer trance myself. And, and it's taken me years of therapy once I, you know, to help me get out of the legal profession and find my way to a more connected and fulfilling life. And, and now looking back, I, n I remember what it was like to be in that trance. And I know a lot of people who are still in there, and, and I'm not fully out of it by any means myself yet. Okay. So I don't know if Julie Bargman has been in therapy, but she lets off steam very easily. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's really interesting. She starts life as a sculptor and then goes into landscape uh, architecture and sees it as a regenerative act for what we have produced in industrial society. I love the name of her studio, Dirt, uh, which is Design Investigations Reclaiming Terrain or uh, Dump It Right There. And uh, it's, it's, she's teaching, she's documenting, she spends an awful lot of time on brown sites, on, on super fun sites, on analyzing what's in there, what we have done, what we have done to dirt. Dirt is a very healthy thing. Dirt is what, is what makes us healthy. We made it sick. So Julie, what are you doing with dirt that makes that, that sick dirt healthy? Well. Uh, let's see. Um, first of all, I, uh, I feel that there's a need to reveal it, uh, plain and simple. Uh, dig it up and let everybody see it. Um, you know, we've spent a century and a half of industry that in a way didn't know any better, but they probably did, of digging up stuff and in the process making it poisonous and dumping it, you know, um, anywhere they kind of felt like it, conveniently enough in most of our waterways. Um, and then, you know, we extract all that stuff, poisoning the earth, and then we make, you know, buildings and everything else we make, and then we put it back in the earth, in the landscape, and it's all messed up, right? So um, uh, it's infuriating, you know, that we're subject to that, um, and there's a real, um, lack of transparency on the part of industries and corporations that continue to do this business as usual as much as the EPA has been trying to be um, the police. Um, they still can't patrol it. So we need to patrol 
um, vehemently, um, uh, we, all to, we all have to get a little more pissed off. So who did you get pissed off lately? Oh, who, did I, who did I piss who off? Did you, who did you get pissed off and who, who, uh, who uh, sort of went off the handle once you, once you really read them the riot act? Be honest. You're among friends. Um, hmm. Let me <laughs> let me choose. Uh, <laughs> and many. <laughs> uh, probably one of the most memorable is um, when I was working uh, with Bill McDonough for the Ford Motor Company, um, and uh, Big Bill uh, Ford, um, of course, uh, is pretty green, um, but a lot of his uh, folks in the environmental office um, uh, are not. And um, the head of that office um, used to literally cringe when I walked in the door. Um, I've actually learned that it's, it's not tremendously helpful to piss people off, but it's sometimes pretty effective. Uh, and so uh, he would cringe, and he had no idea why he should do anything differently. Um, and uh, I just kept pointing out to him, you know, the number of people, number of workers that probably worked at um, Ford for a century and a half that, you know, um, probably, you know, have died of cancer, right? So, um, so anyway, um, the, the happy thing is, is that I was determined to make this guy the champion of the project which was really crazy of me. Um, but um, I, the, the best part you know, for me was that uh, it was actually probably just a year ago or so, um, I was at this, um, uh, sorry, uh, Wildlife Habitat Conservancy, Wildlife Council, Habitat Council, and who was on the board with me, but um, Mr. got angry at me and he was presenting um, all of the work they had done uh, right in the area that um, had pissed them off before. So do you know what uh, made him drink the Kool-Aid? What? What made him drink the Kool-Aid? I mean, you know, what, uh, what, what made him turn into an environmentalist if he was so resistant in the beginning? You know, I think that people just come around and, f and, and know that it just makes sense. You know, it's all friggin' common sense you know, really when it comes down to it. And it's almost like you just have to, you know, make some sense, you know, so, and I have to say that's the other part is that I've gone the way of, of trying to make more sense and making people uncomfortable rather than pissing them off. So, so uh, that's a very important point because I think collaboration and working mm. together, many experts working together, interdisciplinary, uh, knowledge together need, is needed to solve these big problems. Yeah. They are, uh, for the architects, I mean, who are your collaborators right now as opposed to even five years ago? Mm. Well, actually, uh, our city governments, uh, they're strong backers. Uh, the city of Dallas has a sustainable design program. Uh, and, and it's unfortunate from my perspective because uh, Again, it's the clients who are pushing us to do the right thing, mm -hmm. what Julie mentioned. So the old excuse that architects used to have, you know, that whiny voice that, oh, the client doesn't let me do this. Uh, is that, that's not, is that still valid in your opinion? Or <laughs> the, the, the sort of the uninformed client? Or are they coming to you more and more? Well, you're working with the city of Dallas and they're very open to this right now. But uh, is that still, the client is still the resistant part? Well, some, but y you know, that's an excuse we can't uh, accept. We, we have to educate and, uh, and what we've really focused on is, uh, is what the EPA has. It's called their target finder and uh, it's an energy reduction tool that you can do within about a three minute period at the very beginning of your design and give that to not only your client but your mechanical engineer, your electrical engineer and, and state to him, okay, this is, this is our goal for energy consumption for this project. 
So, a so tool. the engineer is not your enemy. No. Okay. I mean, you know, I hear this. It's like, well, the engineer did that. I mean, okay. I'm not going to go into that because. Uh, well, well but then I'll since get you brought it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One thing, uh, and I really believe this is a sustainable uh, initiative within the industry is is shifting the way we do projects from kind of a silo approach to what we term an integrated project delivery where we get everybody sitting around the table the architects the engineers the contractors the users of the building the maintenance personnel the facility managers and really discuss what the building needs to be and how it should be designed from the initial stages. And, so it, and it becomes much more of an efficient process, uh, much more sustainable. It, it gets everybody buying into what we're trying to accomplish. So we're talking about the web of relationships, not mm. the throwing over the partition relationships. I'm done Correct. with it. It gets the engineer, mm. gets the, the landscape architect. So mm. everybody does their separate work and nobody knows what the others are doing. This way, everybody is in the discussion initially, which is really healthy and probably makes really good building. Absolutely, yes. Uh, so let's, uh, let's kind of bring it down to a smaller scale, to packaging. Mm -hmm. um, this, uh, I mean, uh, I, we come from a time where Okay, let's not talk about it. We're, let's talk about Christmas and the holidays. Packaging is huge. I mean, it's the paper, the, the fillings, the packaging. We are going to produce, I don't know, you probably know how much tonnage we produce every Christmas or every holiday. Uh, how, how are we pulling back on this? That's so unnecessary. There's so much unnecessary stuff that we do in packaging. What's the wisdom in the packaging industry about how we, how we buy things and sell things? Well, I really can't speak to it around a given holiday, but we do collect data on an annual basis nationally. And um, we know that the amount of municipal solid waste generated per person has been leveled off and is about the same. Municipal solid waste being polite for trash. And, um, but we have more people, so the amount of trash that we're making is actually going up every year. Um, a number of companies um, across the entire value chain, from the people who make materials to the people who make packages, the people who put stuff in those packages, and then the people who sell it, are beginning are realizing that for a number of dis different reasons that there's value in making changes in that packaging. For one thing, um, somebody famous, I don't know, said, Waste is something that you buy and then you throw it away. When you think about it like that, it doesn't sound like a particularly smart decision. So you need to consider what it is that you want to throw away and what value it has and whether you want to pay for it. People are making packaging changes um, on consumer packaged goods, the kinds of material that I work with most often, and are saving money. I mean, they're, they're making money at this by source reduction, which is the big benefit in energy and greenhouse gases. Don't make it to begin with. That's you know obviously where the big benefit is, but in reducing packaging, in designing packaging so it can be disassembled for recycling, in choosing materials that can be recycled, in designing the packaging so it's smaller, and um, only does the job that it needs to do, but you still have to do the job because quite often the carbon tag price tag of what's inside the package may be greater than the carbon footprint of the package, and so you want to protect that. But changes are being made, and I have seen some really dramatic examples. One case in point was, um, you know, if you go to the store and buy some electronic little doodad. So it comes in a great big PVC blister, you know, like this big, with a big piece of white paper and a little thingy down at the bottom, and lots of print, you know, that's the theater part of the package, just grab your attention. Some really smart guy out in California designed an alternative package. It's made of corrugated, it's about this big. So it's maybe a third the, the height. Um, it has a little window in the bottom with a pop-out PET blister. It's a very cool looking package. I mean, it's kind of new and snazzy looking. The whole thing comes apart. All pieces of it are recyclable. It is stronger. 
so you can stack them up higher in the truck. It is smaller, so you can get more of them in the truck to begin with. It weighs less, so the transportation impacts are smaller. The materials themselves have a smaller carbon investment. Then there's the recycling potential. And on top of all that, it costs about half as much as the first one. That's, that's a total winner in packaging. That kind of work is going on everywhere. Um, the ultra-compacted detergents is another great example. Um, it, I think it started with Unilever and they're all small and mighty detergent. Now all of the laundry detergent manufacturers have committed to making an ultra-compacted detergent. I think by very early 2008 they'll be on the store shelves. The benefits are um, there's less uh, polyethylene in the bottle, clear benefit source reduction, and it's still recyclable. There's a lot less water in the package. Um, so there's some water use implications at the front end. It's lighter for the number of uses that you have to have. So there's transportation efficiencies in driving it around. Because it's smaller, you can get more in the truck. So you can des deliver more wash loads you know, per truck at the very end. It's, it's a complete winner. People are stepping back, and it's cheaper for everybody. It's cheaper for the guy who doesn't have to buy the water to put in it and to buy the bottles and all those other things. I think it's fabulous for people to make a buck doing this because it's a great reason for people to keep doing it. Um, but I think that answered the question. Th these changes, people are considering them and considering all of the good reasons to do it, and they're happening at an incredible pace. So on an individual level, I know, Chris, that you won't touch bottled water because it comes in a package and uh, you, you'd rather have it uh, from the tap. Uh, can we talk a little bit about your personal decisions on how you personally, after going out there and photographing all this junk, how are you integrating that, uh, that thought into your personal life and your family's life? Um, well, I've had the experience of, of trying some, some going green things in, in my own life and and it's, it's really, it's very different from what I imagined that it would be. Like for Christmas, we decided uh, in, in our whole family, we're only going to give each other experiences as gifts. So that there's no stuff going to pass back and forth between my wife and I and, and our son. And then all of our Christmas cards we're making out of paper that we get out of our own recycling bin. Um, and then we, our Christmas tree, we're in the process of making it out of old pieces of bamboo that were piled up in our backyard. And when we, when we first started talking about that, it sounded like, oh, that's going to suck. It's going to kind of ruin <laughs> Christmas. And it turned out it's so much fun because we've been pulling paper out of our recycling bin and like using the back of coupons to start making cards. And then you can you know, draw, draw smiley faces and like turn the coupon into, into a parody of itself. And, and, then, uh, and then giving experiences We've actually been doing that for a really long time, so giving, giving tickets to a jazz concert or to a lecture, or I'm giving my son uh, a few lessons with a computer hacker. <laughs> 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 and those hack. things are just as good as getting stuff, and actually, in, in a way, they're more enriching and more fun. And building our own Christmas tree is incredibly much cooler and, and just more, th there's more connection in it than going out and buying a Christmas tree. And the other thing is, that, that every single time we do one of those, those, those activities that is th that like a green sort of a thing, in, in some instances there is a, a, a sacrifice. Like I, I turned vegetarian recently because I learned just about how the, the incredible environmental impact of eating factory farmed meat. And, and it was a sacrifice because I love eating hamburgers. Like a burger with fries and a beer is my favorite meal. And, and yet, since I've, I've turned vegetarian, every single time I have the opportunity to turn down eating meat, there's this little feeling of, ah, oh, dang, that would have been good. And there's this great big feeling of, of, of well-being that comes from it. It's like just this, this little surge of, of, of a sense of goodness. And it connects me with myself more deeply, and it makes me feel more connected with the earth and with other people. And, and, and so I'm experiencing that, that there's this un, like unanticipated benefit to doing these things. Um, and so, so how old is your son? He's, a, he's in sixth grade. He's 11. Okay. So, so how do you keep him away from the Xbox and the, the craziness that every kid is pushing 
at him. I mean, this, he's living in this consumer culture. So uh, these experiences that you talk about seems like a really great idea, and it pulls the family together. You create things together. You're, you're involved. You get to know each other more. All of that is really fantastic. But the outside pressures on this kid must be enormous. So how do you get, how do you remediate that? I mean, what, what is it that you have to do as a parent to mm. keep this kid sane? Well, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> how, how many parents? Yeah. Few. Well, my experience is that, that kids get this stuff. That, because going green, it just makes common sense. You know, and, and what we're doing as a culture, the destructive things that we're doing to the environment and, and, and the, the ways that we're exploiting other cultures around the world, it doesn't make sense. And, and so to start teaching a child about recycling or about using 100% post-consumer recycled paper to, for your art, like, it doesn't take any convincing. Um, and and in, in Seattle, uh, where I'm from, the, the, the schools are pretty progressive that way. And so these messages are coming, at, at, at least at my son, they're coming from all different directions. And every single class he's been in since kindergarten, there have been interesting things going on, like where they're doing a compost bin, and they're recycling all their lunchroom waste, and using recycled materials to, to do art and stuff like that. Yeah. So the kid is not stranded in this consumer culture, but he's, he has other supports than just you guys, you and, you and your yeah. wife. And he wants a, a new computer monitor. Yeah. And uh, so he's going to have to think yeah. about it. Yeah, there's, there's a balance. There's a, there's yeah. a struggle. It's a str you know, we all face this struggle as yeah. Americans. But, but he's going to have to recycle his old one. Well, he's just going to have to use his old one for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. OK. <laughs> All right, so Julie, yeah. Julie, I mean, you are really well known for uh, working with your grad students to um, do some amazing work. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are uh, literally shaping the next generation in a very, very positive way through their education. Contaminating them. Uh, contaminating them. There, there are a couple them. of contaminants in the audience. Yes, they're very, uh, it's a very nice way of contaminating <laughs> since you're working with contaminants. You're doing the positive contamination. Can you talk a little bit about your process, how you mm. go about analyzing uh, uh, a site when you go there? How do you work mm. together? What is it? Give us, give us maybe an, one example, or maybe it's a uh, mm -hmm. general idea of, of how this all works for you. It's a fascinating yeah. process. Well, and uh, Courtney and Bennett will tell you that I, uh, I often use this, uh, I talk to them about becoming detectives, you know, the site forensics. You know, and we take these, talk about fun, you know, got to make it fun, you know, and, and we just really learn to, uh, how to see the landscape uh, in all its layers, uh, th that invisibility. Um, so a lot of, um, uh, a lot of emphasis on the site histories. Courtney went back to get a degree in history also, so she got, you know, crazed, you know, but that idea um, actually is how much those site histories reveal something about the landscape and that folks then can appreciate that the landscape is a, a living thing. Um, we often talk about, um, I often talk about with my students and for myself, reminding myself that we're the voice of the landscape uh, because nobody's, you know, the, the landscape is screaming but nobody's really hearing it. So if you become this voice of the landscape, you can talk about you know, okay, I have a troubled past, you know, but let's understand it. I was, you know, a coking oven, you know, a coke oven for centuries, you know, um, and it has its industrial past, but it also has human agency embedded in it. And I think that's too, when I was saying that before about the Ford guy is, I think that's when he started to see that, um, uh, the landscape was alive and not anonymous and that you just couldn't n not help it, you know. So um, I think that there's something about the, in tracing those histories, there's also something about the projection of a site's evolution. And I think that's what, you know, the students and I work on is that idea of being this catalyst, catalyst right, that the that the site could continue to be unhealthy or it could go down a really bad path um, or it can uh, regenerate itself. Um, 
you know, not, not erasing it, you know, I often call it hogging and hauling it away, you know, to someplace else and displace that history and displace the contaminants, but actually embrace what you have there and work with it. And sometimes it's really hard work, really hard work. I mean, folks just actually do want to just scrape up that stuff and haul it away, you know, and just begin anew. So, but the question I, is, where do you take it? Well, someplace in New Jersey, <laughs> so where I'm from. So um, yeah, I'm from there too. Yeah, we have yeah. enough of that stuff. We can't have yeah. uh, any more. So uh, here's something really interesting. By the way, this forensics thing is very interesting because in every area of design, designers are working almost like CSI agents, mm -hmm. crime scene investigators. It's it's also not uh, not an accident that we have our culture is full of forensic information right now because mm -hmm. everybody's sort of digging, digging for for information. Um, uh, the, the thing that I wanted to hear you say, uh, Julie, uh, something very specific about yeah. New Orleans. Okay. Uh, uh, talk about the things that you find there and how you're treating things, because I think that's a very specific place, and each space, space and each place is very specific yeah. to itself. Yeah. So let's let's kind of see what your okay. work is in New Orleans. Yeah, I you know it's it's really um, it's it's really almost a. Uh, a perverse kind of opportunity in New Orleans that, um, you know, uh, uh, on the average, 50% of it, you know, is, you know, unoccupied. Um, and in a way, it's, it, you know, maybe a, being a bit opportunistic, but that's a lot of dirt, you know, to take care of um, and literally have the chance from building from the ground up, um, which a lot of folks don't ever think about. You know, they just want to rebuild on top, and what they don't really realize is that, you know, we often say there was a disaster before the disaster, you know, basically lead infested soils down there, uh, highest rate of uh, lead poisoning in New Orleans in the country. So, you know, there's literally, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, a necessity to build from the ground up. And um, I'm going to just say something really nasty about new urbanists who just want to come and do their pattern and plop it down, you know. Um, I think they're a bunch of ambulance chasers, but any. Um, but I think that there's, you know, more substantial, genuine understanding of that ground and and literally build up from there. So an effort I'm engaged in is is that is working with scientists because um, all this stuff really needs to be scientifically sound, or else you're just a sham. Um, so that's been great. Those have been great collaborations. Um, and with an artist to give it a level of visibility and, you know, uh, visibility um, and uh, work to um, uh, really make that soil healthy. Um, so what happens to the lead? Lead never goes away, ever. Um, so uh, the best we can do with the technologies we have now is to um, block it, to bind the lead. Uh, make it, I think I was explaining, not bioavailable, you know, so, so it can't, that I can't, I t I, the chemistry, you know. So, but but it, it can get into the water supply, it can't get into plant life, so that's, not, that's what bioavailable means. It, right. Organic life cannot uh, use it to, as It a won't source. leach. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and then it does involve, you know, for the safety of children who are subject to the lead poisoning, um, a thing that I'm uh, sort of comfortable with is that, that covering part. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, we're binding it. We're, everything needs to be lifted in New Orleans anyway. You know, so um, I'm just thinking it's, there are these great terms uh, there because all the, um, what we're using is the spillway sediment, the bonnet carry, you know, I mean, gajillion, gajillion cubic yards of material um, river sediment that's clean being dumped and not used. So we think actually this could be a big business uh, for New Orleans. Um, and the scientists call it spillway sugar, uh, which is great. And then uh, use biosolids that has the phosphates. So that's the shit. So we put together sugar and shit and make mud cakes. 
So, so uh, what happens to that river, river uh, mud? It's been dumped and it's being dumped even more? It's being dumped into the deeper channel, you know, in the center of the river. So it's not being used. And is that, is there talk about, I mean, you guys talk about it. Uh, are, they, are you advocating for its use and uh, uh, commercial uh, yeah. aspects there? And you're, yeah. you're really No, that's why we, we're, we're saying that it could be, and, and this is what, you know, um, Sarah, you were talking about is, is people are really being entrepreneurial about yeah. this stuff, you know, really entrepreneurial, you know, which is, you know, it's gonna make, it's gonna uh, create a lot of jobs you know, to move the mud around and, you know, uh, so yeah, there's a business in it um, that people just aren't seeing, you know, and these are these, you know, loops, right, that more and more industries are, are really starting to see, you know, and um, I think, you know, we've got a long, long way to go to create those loops, right? So New Orleans, actually, the pictures of New Orleans for years, even now, uh, show an enormous amount of building material that is out mm -hmm. there that is sort of considered garbage and uh, waste, and it really is material. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we begin to think about buildings and uh, building waste as a resource? I mean, we talk about uh, um, remediation and design for disassembly and uh, disassembling buildings now, but uh, how, how does an architect, for instance, not specify new materials, but a used material, and get away with it because people say, well, that's junk, I don't want that in my building. It used to be said that way. So how do you guys deal with that? Well, let me, let me uh, touch back on New Orleans and Katrina, and, uh, and a, a point that, that I really think we need to make is, um, as our weather patterns with global warming change, we're gonna see more violent storm events. Yeah. Uh, part of our business is working for FEMA on storm remediation and there's a tremendous amount of storm debris after a tornado, a hurricane, and one thing that uh, you know, FEMA has a publication on, on how to handle all this, but if the local agencies don't have any sort of recycle program in place, mm. then uh, then all that, you know, metal from the trailers uh, twisted up, it, it just goes to the landfill. So, so you, do you see more, or do any of you see more action on the local level? I think there's, there's a yeah. lot of interesting stuff going on with the mayors in, in various American cities that are very active and very much into the environmental issues. So let's talk about some of those local uh, local uh, issues uh, in in terms of packaging product, in terms of uh, Sarah. What what's what's your local story? Hmm. Um, in in terms of packaging, I think I have to look at it a little more broadly than that. There's many people are aware of a lot of actions there's been at the municipal level um, and in some cases on state level in terms of bags, shopping bags, the plastic seat, one use bags. Um, and in some places they've been banned outright. In other places there's been specifications for biodegradable or compostable bags only. Um, the, these are, they're, the local decisions, and there's all sorts of inputs that feed into local decisions, and it would be arrogant of me to comment on any of them, but the one thing that's important in these decisions is that the ultimate end, end life scenario of these sorts of decisions be considered. Um, in places where people get really excited about biodegradable, comp uh, biodegradable packaging or biodegradable bags, but if it's biodegradable and it's going to a landfill, which is usually the, the end of life scenario for a biodegradable material, it's going to a landfill, and it's not a landfill where methane landfill gas is being collected, then in fact it's going to biodegrade and produce methane, which contributes to the problem we're all trying to solve. And that might not have been the best decision. Um, so we need to think them through to the logical conclusion. Compostable bags, compostable serveware, all these things, are great 
if and only if they're getting into a compost collection stream where they're going to the appropriate end of life. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you just pay a lot more for something that's going to go sit in the landfill. You know, it, was it really the right decision? So a lot of times, a lot of decisions being made around our everyday consumer items are being made um, in a more knee-jerk fashion because it sounds like the right idea. Um, it's biodegradable. What might be good? I can fling it out the window and it'll go away. Well, there is no such thing as a way. We live with it forever in one guise or another. Um, so that's what a lot of the action that I see going on. Um, and that's not you know, just municipal. It's happening at state levels as well. And people are specifying things. And in some cases, the specifications make perfect sense. And in other cases, they don't. So it's really interesting because we are always getting back to this sort of whole system of things. Life cycle mm -hmm. perspective. It's, it's never, ever that one decision that is going to resolve. Uh, the one decision helps, but it, every decision has its implications. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how, how do we sort of open up our minds to think that, OK, so if our municipality or our area is going to go for biodegradable, we better have a dump that is harvesting the methane. It would be helpful. It would be helpful to. And if you're going to have compostable, require compostable bags, or you're going to have a facility that's going to compostable plates, well, mm -hmm. then let's collect it for composting, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But where's the transparency for knowing about those flows? That's I right. mean, how do we, how do we, how are we going to keep track of where things go? Um, to some extent, this is what um, conversations like this are about. It's for people to want to know. Because the information's there. Really, in many cases, at a, at a more immediate level, not that hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. And then at a national level, we, we have oodles of data that you can get into and see. You know, I can tell you how many landfills there are. We have a landfill program and landfill methane outreach program. There's lots of data at a national level. You know, in that in-between level, it, it may be harder to figure out. But a lot of people are working on it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, actively seeking answers. And, you know, sometimes there's not a perfect answer. Sometimes the right answer isn't so clear. But what I find at a personal level, that quite often there's usually some dividing line and there's a group of good answers and a group of really bad answers. And, you know, as long as we're on one side of that dividing line, you're doing better. Um, and those are the choices that I hope to help people make. Yeah. But transparency in data in terms of um, the, uh, claims that are being made about materials that are compostable. Um, th that we have seen some things in the marketplace where people might be playing fast and loose with those definitions. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I think that there is the the industry will be self policing at that point mm -hmm. because other people who are playing by the rules are offended by their colleagues who are not. So I, uh -huh. I think a lot of that is going to be self-correcting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's also something in our favor, which is our new, new relatively new communication system, where uh, in a, a few years ago, before the internet, corporations and individuals uh, could do things that were unethical or s uh, strangely mm -hmm. sort of underhanded and that stuff gets out so fast, mm -hmm. and five bloggers get it out there, and millions of people know about it the next day. So there's that sort of availability of information, a lot of bad information, but there are a lot of really good information, too, that's out there. That's right, and, and different agencies are considering how they can help with these conversations. Currently, the Federal Trade Commission has their green guides out, are, are open for comment right now, and will be for a while, um, where they're seeking public input on how they help moderate those conversations as well. Um, transparency well, of data is always an issue. Well, uh, there's also, the for landscape architects among you, there's that sustainable sites initiative that mm -hmm. the landscape architects yep. uh, just put mm -hmm. out a couple of uh, months ago. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, out there for comment also. Mm -hmm. that, is, uh, that is a very public forum. So I think, I think we are using, all of us are using these, uh, these outlets to, to reach each other and to learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I'd like to open it up to the audience. And, and there's some questions. There's a, there's a question back here, one first, and then there's a couple of them back there. 
Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I was really encouraged to hear uh, about how a lot of businesses are uh, looking at win-win uh, situations and easy ways that they can both cut down their costs and cut down the waste um, in the products that they make and in, in the landfills. Um, I'm just curious about what kind of uh, insights that you may have about how businesses can further internalize costs to the environment when those win-win situations have all sort of been used up because I can see a point in the future when you know all of the light bulbs have been changed out and all of the shopping bags have gone away yet I believe there's still quite a bit more work that will need to be done when those easy choices go away uh, so I'm just curious about how businesses can internalize costs or how consumers I should say citizens um, can work to to help continue that initial mm. push to improve the conditions of our environment. Who'd like to tackle that, Sarah? Would you like to jump at that one? Oh, jump at it. I have to think about it for a minute. Um, personally, I think that we have many years yet before all the low-hanging fruit has been plucked. I think there's a lot of it. But uh, eventually, that it's going to, to get tougher. But I also think that as uh, resources dwindle, and energy costs go up, and as climate implications, if they continue on the path they are, I think that the economics of this will continue to change in the favor of, uh, of the work that we're all doing now. So I think more low-hanging fruit will continue to appear because I think materials are gonna get more expensive. There's some body of thought out there um, and, and I don't understand it well enough to know if I agree with it or not, but somebody I thought that says that in the foreseeable future, a lot of, of non-renewable uh, resources are gonna disappear. If you don't own the material now, you're not gonna have it later. That certainly is gonna influence the economics, and even if that's an overstatement of the case, it's, it may be in the direction that we're going. So I think that there will continue to be, I, I don't see a, situation where the economics are going to be um, impossible. I'd, I'd like to follow up with Tim on that, that question because uh, building materials, as the world's building materials stock is being used uh, incredibly actively in not only in the U.S. but Western Europe and of course China and, and uh, the Middle East and enormous building booms occur. Uh, have, you, have you guys estimated how uh, the, the, the price of steel and concrete has gone up in the past few years. I read these enormously scary numbers once in a while. Have you, have you yourselves experienced uh, well, them? Well, the most recent spike has been with aluminum and curtain wall. Uh, it's just, it's, it's uh, I don't know, it's double what it was a year ago. Uh, it wasn't that many years ago when all of our scrap metal was being shipped to China for their building boom. So, uh, you know that that happens all the time. Um, there's a there's research done by uh, Professor Solis down in uh, Texas A&M University, and and he is studying what impact resources have uh, and the construction industry on sustainability. And uh, you just mentioned you know, we're gonna run out of our natural resources. And he's projected that uh, in another 25 years, we'll use up all the copper, uh, another 40, all the iron ore, and another 60, all the aluminum, mm -hmm. if, if we continue down the same path. So, um, kind of what I mentioned earlier, you know, we're at a really critical point where we have 20 years to be very innovative with new concepts and, and uh, technologies to change this consumption path that we're on. Well, it's also very interesting to hear that uh, some of the, some of the um, mayors in towns where there was an industrial base are beginning to think about bringing that base back in inventing and manufacturing the new kinds of products mm. that this new economy will need. So, for instance, Grand Rapids, Michigan is uh, turning an auto parts factory into a windmill parts factory. 
and this will keep happening in very interesting ways because we are, uh, Texas is the, the second in the world use of wind power. I mean, it's, uh, who knew? Mm -hmm. I saw it on public television. It's like, I'm really proud of you, wow. Uh, so uh, it, it's really interesting to see that, uh, that, uh, that shift that has occurred in the last even two years about our materials and how we think about them. The amount of fly ash that's used in concrete today mm -hmm. is, is uh, you know, it's huge. I mean, you're, you're actually using an industrial waste material mm -hmm. to make a building material that, uh, do you guys use fly ash in your building? Yes, uh, our standard uh, specification now for the, uh, the concrete piers that go down to the rock is 50% fly ash. Uh, the grade beams are 30%, and then our, our exposed slabs are 25%. And of course, what we haven't even thought about, and that's also the future of business here, is when we stop burning coal and we don't produce the fly ash, what will concrete be made of? Because uh, this is a, a, that's a resource material now. Waste is a resource. But when we could become more efficient, mm -hmm. we're going to really have to invent a whole new set of materials. There were some questions back there. Uh, Mike, please. Uh, <clears throat> after hearing the comment about new urbanists, I just wanted to point oh, out sorry. that it was the new urbanists that brought back to life uh, walkable urbanism. Yes. And the creation of it and the principles of it and all that, which now we're finding out that walkable cities and towns actually save something like 40 to 90 percent of the energy mm -hmm. just because the buildings share walls because you can walk to things <coughs> and um i heard the the part about new york that 80 percent of it's from buildings which is big but in, that's actually a good thing because that means that it's so walkable that the transportation is not the big percent so I just wanted to say that, you know, bring up the importance of the actually assembling places into walkable communities and how much energy is actually saved. Mm -hmm. So the density issue is huge. Yeah. I don't think you meant that part of it. You meant the, no. the little doodads that they, they insist on creating these neo-traditionalist buildings. I don't think no, anybody's uh, debating the tightness of new urbanism. I think it's a great idea. No, density is Density bit. is great. You. We seem to have a lot of talent on our stage. We also seem to have a lot of talent in our audience. I'm looking for people who are experts on the thermodynamics of chimneys. Um, I'm also looking for the people who are interested in activism in redesigning um, Washington, D.C. for um, energy efficiency. A group of them spoke at the Green Festival in September. Do I have anyone who's can respond to any of these issues. Raise your hand and at the cocktail party you can meet. <laughs> no, he has a question. Okay, well, uh, uh, the, the lady with the hat, find her with the, with the answer to the chimney and the, and the greening of Washington after this program because she's, she's right here. Okay, please. Hi, my name is Paul. I'm a planner and also an everyday people. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> my question is, is mainly for Sarah, but uh, you know, any, any response would be very helpful. Uh, Europe has many product uh, package recycling mm -hmm. programs like Der Grüne Punkt and uh, Der Blue Angel, mm -hmm. the, the, the Blue Angel, the Green Point. Uh, are, are any governments, uh, either federal, state, or local in the U.S., working on such a program here? Um, I think I can say that that is not happening at the federal level and um, certainly not to that extent at the state level. So the, some states are more active on that legislative horizon than others. Um, some are taking um, more focused approaches. So um, uh, North Carolina has, is, um, has legislation that I think it's going into effect soon, almost a little bit track here, but that will require, um, they call it the ABC uh, legislation, it will require bars and restaurants to recycle. So I mean, there's some things like that, but I am not aware of anything to the extent that's happening in Europe. 
Well, one thing, one thing I just wanted to mention, which is really interesting, we've been uh, uh, watching the market that serves the architect and the interior designer uh, who uh, end up buying, you know, a thousand chairs at a clip for large amounts of building materials. And because that community has been very vocal to their manufacturers about the uh, green issues, the, the uh, um, manufacturers that serve that market have been trying very hard to figure out how to be greener and better and safer and use more recycled material. So I think that, that in that case, consumer, large volume consumer pressure has made a difference and is making a huge difference. And there are some sustainability, a number of sustainability conversations going on within particular industries, particularly as related to the building, um, the built community, I'm learning to say that, and I think it's being influenced by leads, so I know that there's some um, textile um, conversations going on, and some of those may end up resulting in um, certification programs, but they certainly, to my knowledge or not, would not be legislative. I don't know of any. There's also uh, the, the question for all of us here, the um, uh, e-junk that we produce, the electronic crap that we put out there, the, that iPhone that we you bought. We call it e-waste. E-waste, excuse me. <laughs> uh, the e-waste, uh, that, that iPhone that you just bought for Christmas is gonna be probably e-waste very shortly. And uh, it has all kinds of uh, deadly materials in it, including what, mercury and stuff like that. Um, I don't know for sure, but it's there, I'm sure. So we, I think we all have to really figure out how to think about that. I would say that um, I have colleagues at EPA, I'm not involved in this effort, um, only peripherally, who have a big conversation going with the uh, producers of those electronic materials, as well as retailers, a number of retailers, um, and they are working on certification standards for recycling those materials as well as very active take back programs and that's one that's taken on, um, you know, it's got uh, a direction with a bullet and part of that is because states in fact were all taking on e-waste on their own and writing legislation mm -hmm. and the industry was faced with um, having to respond to ultimately 50 different e-waste laws which I think was a very daunting prospect for them and I can see how it would be. Um, so everybody sort of come together to do s a, a, some national opportunities and standards there. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's some questions back there. Hi, I uh, currently live in Baltimore County and I, however, spent most of my life in uh, Portland, Oregon. And I grew up with a bottle bill that I think is probably close to 40 years old. I, I grew up with the, bo with the bottle bill back in Oregon, which is probably mm -hmm. close to 40 years old, and I've always wondered why is it that we don't use models of places where there is a system that works efficiently, and sort of the hidden um, carrot in that situation was, for instance, growing up, realizing that you can recycle this item, and it gets you thinking on that path of what else can I recycle. You know, I'm not going to throw this, I'm not throwing out my car window or whatever. And I just feel like that there are so many communities that have not taken advantage of systems, um, either international or within this, the states, who have systems who work that that work efficiently, and we're not using that on a more um, universal level in our mm -hmm. in our country. And um, also, I do find myself sort of in that cartoon at the at the checkout counter with you know. 40 people behind me while I decide whether paper or plastic, you know, I, I feel like there, I've never heard a definitive answer in terms of, because I recycle everything I have that I got my hands on, I try to find, you know, does this have another life somehow, some other use, and I drive my family crazy, but, um, you know, I feel like that's the one mark that I can make, but um, is there a definitive answer, if, there, if I recycle both my bags and and plastic, but if it goes down to, like you said, the detergent, am I, am I buying plastic? Is that worse than buying paper at this point? And um, so I don't know who to really address that to, but I appreciate your answer, thank you. I think Sarah might be the I one. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, this, I think, speaks back to the transparency of the yeah. data issue yeah. that we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that there is a right answer on the paper versus plastic issue. 
I personally have seen a lot of data on both sides of it. Both of them come up with a, a definitive answer that one or the other is right. And I think it, um, as with so many questions, the answer is, well, it depends. But I think the one thing that you can say is what you do with it at the end of life is what tips it. So um, it, it may be that that's one of those things that one of them is more, is a better answer in one region than another. Transportation distance falls. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into it. But whichever one you choose to do, the one that's the right thing for you, as long as you make sure that it's managed appropriately at end of life, then you're doing the best you can do with the data that you have. I wish I could tell you which one was the right answer, but I don't know. And I don't know that any third party can step back and say. Does anybody know? Any? Yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> Not an expert, but uh, a few months ago, there was a, an article in the Washington Post on just that subject, okay. and mm -hmm. did you see it? Yeah. And it, our interpretation was that there were downsides on, on both sides, but that the production process involving paper was so much more caustic. Um, it, it, the chemicals were so much more caustic, it sounded more harmful. But one thing the article said that I thought was very interesting was that, you know, we all think we're being very good by bringing our plastic bags back to the recycling bins at the grocery stores. But uh, it said that a lot of the plastic bags are being shipped over to India and China and being incinerated over there. Uh, and obviously, there's something wrong <laughs> with the economics if we can't if we can't uh, justify uh, recyc doing our own recycling. So Does anyone it, know anything about that? It would probably be inappropriate for me to disagree with the Washington Post, but I do know that there are very, very robust markets in the United States for all of that film. Um, linear low density and high density polyethylene film, which is what the t-shirt bags are made out of, and the sleeve that Washington Post comes in, and the dry cleaning bag, on and on and on. Very robust markets for it. Um, as a matter of fact, just a few miles west of here, Trex makes um, high-end decking out of that material. And there's, Trex there isn't the only one. There's places like that all over the United States that just can't get enough material. So if, in fact, some of it did go somewhere, um, I, I don't believe that that is the norm. There are strong markets for it. And if you see it going to India, uh, call yeah. up your congressman or somebody. Yeah. I would never suggest anybody do that. <laughs> Before we have I another question, yeah. um, I'd like to chime in on the, the paper versus, versus plastic thing as well. Um, it's a red herring. That's the, that's the way I would answer that question. The, the paper versus plastic issue, it, it's, it's one of those things that takes up a lot of our attention. And there are all these articles. and like. And what I think it really is, it's a reflection of the, the degree of denial that we're in as a culture. Yeah. Because it's all it is is a gesture. Whether you choose paper or plastic at the supermarket or if you bring canvas bags, it's nothing but a gesture. And if we all stop using supermarket bags today, the, the, the environmental catastrophe that is coming would still arrive. Because the, the real things we need to look at are the kind of cars we drive, the amount, of, the amount we drive, the amount we fly around on jets, the amount of factory farm beef that we eat. Like there, there are issues that are much bigger than the paper versus plastic. And the thing is, paper versus plastic, it's one of those easy uh, black and white kind of issues that, that it's, easy to, it's easy to fall into and say, well, I choose, you know, I bring canvas bags to the market, and so I'm an environmentalist. And so I would urge people to, to just let the paper versus, versus plastic thing go and, and look Look at your own lives and look within your sphere of influence, meaning the business that you work for and yeah. the practices that they engage in, the people that they buy from, where your supply is coming from. If you're, if you're a t-shirt manufacturer, are you buying organic cotton or are you buying cotton that's grown with pesticides? Those kind of things are what really matters. So that's my tirade about paper versus plastic. Okay, okay, but now I have to chime in with my tirade just so that I absolutely agree with you with one exception, which is please still recycle that material. The and, national, yes, thank you very and, much, and, because yeah. it's, yes. it's not a don't, don't do this because it really doesn't yeah. matter. It matters a lot. The national average recycling rate in the United States last year, 2006, was 
by our estimates, um, that resulted in an energy savings of about 1.3 quadrillion BTUs. A quadrillion of anything is a bunch, and when it's energy, it's really a bunch. And that is roughly the equivalent of 52 power plants, the output of 52 power plants. And we didn't squeeze cans and get energy out of them. What you did is it was energy that was left on the grid for other uses. But that's 52 power plants that we didn't have to build. And that has other environmental implications. Um, and, and then there's resources that are left. It goes on and on and on. Do make those other decisions. Consider how your life is and, and all of those choices that you make that we talked about earlier. But manage those materials at the end of life, whichever ones you do take home. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to also, I'm flashing back to your question, you know, about the tougher stuff, you know, and the, and the low-hanging fruit we're talking about here. And to me, the toughest stuff that we kind of scooted around there was the stuff going off to India, you know, and the stuff going to China and, you know, that we're getting, you know, loads of stuff there and, you know, poisoning uh, the people there. And that is... And that is the, you know, the social costs, you know, read environmental justice and so on. And I think that's the stuff we're talking economics here a lot, but I'm finding um, as, you know, I work and try to be a voice, not just for the landscape, but for the, uh, for the communities that live in them, uh, that though that is often, uh, they're not heard, but also they, what's not articulated is the cost to them uh, case in point, they mm -hmm. asked us to use specifics. Mm -hmm. um, we just did a study um, for um, Harvard University, who's um, uh, growing, uh, moving across the river into Alston, which is a post-industrial community, um, you know, and very, you know, modest, um, you know, workers' housing that are um, all occupied. And um, they're going to be moving um, extraordinary amount of dirt um, to build that campus, and um, some of it very funky dirt. Um, and uh, so when we went to calculate those costs, um, we talked about the number of trucks, and the graphic we used was they gasped for air when we showed them the number of trucks. Love those numbers, don't you? Mm -hmm. The number of trucks that were going to go rambling through that community. And we just said, so and that was a case too where I didn't piss them off, but they patted us on the head and said, thank you very much. Can you please now go away? <laughs> did, you, did you also remind them of the carbon they were releasing when they dug up that earth? Oh, you know, the whole gamut. You know, it was like when we did our metrics, you know, all of, all of the costs you know, went, you know, and this is this importance, you know, we all need to do for those metrics that, you know, corporations and institutions wants, want to see, but, you know, so many of them, uh, you know, are still, uh, you know, not, uh, not quantifiable. I mean, how do you quantify a, you know, a, a, you know, 200 dump trucks going past your front door every day? You know, so well, you document the asthma cases among children. You, you know, it's da 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 da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe one last question, right? Are you on? Mm. No. Nope. I'm from Ruston, Virginia, and uh, we're a planned community that started in the 1970s. We have our own unique aspects, and we've evolved into something I think far from what was originally intended. But um, currently, there is a new initiative to build what we're calling Nature House. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be an educational and um, park facility. Uh, and it has quite a high profile within the town. However, one of my questions was, why is, not, why is this not being built to lead standard? And the answer consistently has been that the sustainable standard was too expensive. So this is a constantly recurring theme that I'm hearing from many sides. And I'm wondering, um, is there a way of taking an existing design and overlaying it with a design that would be more sustainably acceptable and then showing the variance and seeing what compromises can be made to arrive at a better building? Maybe Tim is the one to answer that one. Well, we hear that. Uh that same argument all the time. And 
uh, I said this at dinner, you know, I, I don't really equate lead to sustainability. Now, it, it's a tremendous program and it helps us all understand all of the aspects of sustainability much better. And the arguments that we hear are, uh, I, I want a green building, I want it to be sustainable, but I don't want to certify it. And you know, there are definitely costs associated with the certification process. Uh, but over the life of the building, the really few elements that you have to do for certification will pay for itself in a very short period of time. Just, just the commissioning that you do on a facility alone uh, will pay back in the energy savings. So I'm not sure I answered your question other than uh, continue to fight to have that building be LEED certified. Well, there's also very interesting information that is just beginning to come out, is that um, buildings that have been, uh, whether they're, they're LEED or following the LEED uh, questioning uh, of, of everything from uh, recyclability to uh, land use to uh, local resources, um, that uh, people who commit to those buildings actually like to document how people work in those buildings because they're proving that they made the right decisions. So more and more of that information is starting to come out. Yeah. And uh, as, that, as that information becomes more public, uh, I think people will see that there is a definite economic and human uh, reason to do these things and the decisions are made easier. For instance, there's a Naval Credit Union building that was built uh, about three years ago in Pensacola, Florida, and they, uh, their most valuable uh, commodity, like every uh, business, is, is the human capital, people who work there. They used to, before they built the lead building, which has all kinds of great daylighting and all kinds of environmental uh, features, before they built that green building, their tur turnover rate was 60%, hmm. which is a huge cost to the company. Hmm. And after they moved into the new building, uh, their turnover is 17%. Those are figures that are really dramatic and really important for us to understand that the quality of life of, uh, for people yeah in buildings that are more sensitive to the environment has, is raised uh, uh, exponentially because being sensitive to nature is being sensitive to human nature. We are products of that, that natural world. Mm -hmm. So I think if, if we think of it that way, it becomes an easier sell and it, uh, in Reston, like everywhere, it has to be a sell right now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but I think there, there maybe you'd like to do, or some of your groups of friends or families or would like to get together and do some research and present some ideas to the committees who are uh, saying no to you at the moment. And mm -hmm. maybe using Julie's tactics, <laughs> overwhelm them with, uh, uh, with facts and figures. Well, it, and I was just gonna make a point about um, how, to, how to communicate, because I'm, <laughs> hopefully trying to learn, and that is n really knowing the audience, you know. Um, I, I often say we're, we engage in stealth sustainability um, because we've encountered a lot of clients who really, I've had clients literally come out and say, I don't care about that stuff, you know. And so, you know, it's like, what, do I quit? No, I just changed my tune, and I you totally talk economics, and all I talked about was aesthetics. That's all I talked about. And I, I had them, you know, looking at, you know, and I just snuck some other things in the back door. Yeah. Seriously. You know, so, you know, I, we, I think we just have to be, you know. Clever. You have to be clever <laughs> and you have to use research that's available and to convince people with the methods of the 20th century are statistical obsessions, use our statistical obsessions to get those, to get to those feelings and to get those, to those emotional points yeah. where people actually make their decisions. And I think on that note, we need to wrap up here because it's eight o'clock.
Yes, just any final thoughts for each of us? What, can I ask one last thing from each of you as we conclude? What's the one idea you'd like the audience to take away with tonight? Mm. Okay. Who wants to start? Everyday decisions and we can change the world. One decision at a time. Chris? Um, well, I've been uh, on lots of panels like this and been doing a, just a ton of public speaking and meeting with, with people who are involved in the Green Movement over the last year. And I just, I want you guys to know that this movement is actually happening. Groups like this are meeting all over the country and, and all over the world. And people who care about, the green, about being green and about our world and about the cultures of other countries are they're appearing at every single level in the most unexpected places in corporations, in companies like Walmart and in McDonald's and, at the, and in our government, especially a year from now. Um, and, and the green movement is being taught at every level in, in, uh, in elementary schools and in universities. People are writing about it, making films about it. And so if you feel like you're alone or you're a, you know, you have to be a maverick to go green, think again because it's this giant wave that's just cresting right now and the people that go green, the businesses that go green are going to be the ones who survive and the ones who don't are going to be the dinosaurs. So it's mm -hmm. just, the, the wave is cresting. Um, and and so, so if, if you feel this urge or if you're involved in, in the green movement, then then hang in there. It won't be long before, before, it, before it's, it's a giant cultural revolution. It's right around the corner. Julie? I'd like to take the um, maybe uh, lower key, um, the flip side of the revolution and just look forward to the time that it's just common sense. Um, so let's not get too hypey-dipey about it and uh, try to really uh, instill uh, in ourselves and in people that this, this just makes some common sense. I'm looking forward to um, the day where we don't use the word green. Um, uh, it's, it, you know, whatever. Green isn't a verb, but it's being used as a verb a lot. Um, and that sustainability is just a, a matter of every everyday um, uh, um, practice. I mean, I know that I'm really struck uh, when you hear, you know, architects speak, you know, uh, which I, you know, you hear them in lectures and, you know, they'll talk about all this stuff and they, it's just a matter of course. They're just like, uh, what's the big deal? You know, and it really puts us to shame. Uh, so I'm just looking forward to, and I think, you know, we might want to look to those models that emulate this, that it's a matter of course. And in some ways, I think if we go forward with that in kind of a calm, strong way, maybe with the revolution, the, you know, nariness of us, you know, beneath our skin, there's some time where you have to just scream. But just to kind of go forward with that kind of confidence and just say, you know, we do it that way, right? Right, yeah. Tim? Uh, I just want to remind us that we're all consumers and uh, we can make a change every time we pull out our wallet or open our pocketbook and buy something. So be, um, sensitive to what you're purchasing, buy more sustainable products. Um, one of the biggest thing you can do is, is when you buy fresh vegetables, if you have a local farmer's market, buy them from your local farmer. And, uh, and if you have an opportunity to purchase green power from a renewable source, do that. It'll make a big difference. I'd like to reinforce uh, the, what, what everybody here talked about, is that you, you make your contributions where you are. I think that, that is, uh, I think it was George Washington Carver who talked about casting down your bucket where your, fish is an where, where your ship is anchored and you pull up the fish that you, you uh, need to survive. And I think that's a very wise and timely thing to think about. What can you do in Reston, in New York, me, uh, uh, in all of your areas? What can we do that is very specific to our skills? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I decided very early on as the editor of Metropolis is that this was an important topic. And mm -hmm. so uh, this, uh, you just don't let up. 
You, I mean, it's like uh, you have no idea how many nasty letters I get. Is, there, is this woman ever happy about anything? Because I'm always critical of, of the design community because they're not moving fast enough for me. Mm -hmm. And I want design to be at the center of this because that's where invention is. And so that's, that's what we all need to do is just to cast down our buckets where we're at. Thank Let's you. give him a big round of applause. Well,